Now let me shift gears because we will now go to the chronic pancreatitis. We will come back to diabetes in the afternoon sessions. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Schwartzman to you now as a speaker. Dr. Schwartzman is a professor in chief of uh, general surgery here at Downstate, as you, or many of you know. He serves also as the assistant dean for education. He was just elected as the upcoming president for the uh, faculty of all of Downstate. Um, his involvement in administrative duties has risen, and he has um, really been the enabler for this for this symposium today. There are many more things that I could uh, um, mention about him, but again, I mean, we're a little bit in a time crunch, and I will stop here as Dr. Schwartzman is going to talk to us now about the economic burden of chronic pancreatitis. Dr. Schwartzman. Good morning. Uh, pleasure to welcome everyone here on campus. Um, so very quickly, um, our goal today is it's quite simple, is to eliminate at least the burden of, of diabetes that is caused by chronic pancreatitis and thus eliminate that cost from all the equations that Dr. Banerjee had just told us. So I think that's not a big deal and I think with all the expertise in this room, this is the direction that we are going to this is what I'm going to talk about, and it's very quickly, it's a long agenda, but Dr. Grusin told me to cut half of my slides yesterday, last night, and I did, but I still intend to go through all of these slides as I go forward. We'll talk about epidemiology, etiology, classification, likelihood of, of chronic pancreatitis, a little bit of Hafiz, just because I like Hafiz as a writer, economic burden, symptoms, long-term sequela, Louis Prima, because he is just uh, quirky and fun, and I'll explain why I wanted to present him. We'll talk about causes of death of, uh, acute, of chronic pancreatitis, lazy statistics, and children, and then a little bit of television. One of the things about chronic pancreatitis, it's such a difficult disease to define. Uh, it's a disease that has originally been described, or at least relationship to alcohol, has been described in, uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century. But then there are so many multiple classifications based on everything that was done since then. The classifications have changed. There is lots of them, and they all talk about various and different things about chronic pancreatitis, not really concentrated on anything in particular. The epidemi epidemiology, therefore, is quite difficult because obviously when you cannot compare things as equals, it becomes very, very difficult. And also, the decrease in the rate of post-mortem examination makes the examination of the pancreas um, uh, significantly more difficult. And this is just an illustration of uh, probably about half of a quarter of all the classifications that we have for chronic pancreatitis. Uh, and I will quote uh, Dr. Grusner, who says, when you have so many classifications or so many ways of doing certain things, probably none of them really work quite well. And indeed, none of them really work quite well. And one of the important ones is the tiger classification. And that takes advantage of various etiological risk factors and actually classifies them. So at least from that perspective, it is quite important. Uh, and any time we have such a difficult topic to discuss, uh, I think it's always important to bring ourselves back to why we are all here. And we are all here really to improve ourselves as physicians, as students, in order to take care of the patients. And I want to bring us very briefly to a bedside of a patient that we had a privilege of taking care of here at Downstate, and some of the residents will remember her, as well as our physician assistant. So the patient, and it's a part one, because she'll weave her story, we'll go through the presentation somewhere. She's a 39-year-old female with history of chronic pancreatitis for the past 11 years. She was diagnosed with something called sphincter of Ori type 3 dysmotility. Have anyone here from all the esteemed colleagues have seen such a disorder? or? Had it confirmed? I don't think so. And actually, this entity is now very much is disputed by Wilcox from University of Alabama, who believes that this is just a functional uh, abdominal pain and nothing specific. But she was given a diagnosis, and perhaps uh, that gave her some reprieve for a little bit. Multiple ERCPs, multiple pancreatic stents. And finally, as many of our, procedure, of our patients end up having, they end up having cholecystectomy as a first step. Of course, it didn't do anything. Then, as some of our patients, 
She also had a Whipple, which is a pancreatic radionectomy for our medical students, which is a removal of a good portion of the pancreas. And did that do anything? Absolutely not. She still continued to have pain. She had celiac block blocks several times. Nothing worked. She wasn't able to eat, and she had a jejunostomy to place. She wasn't tolerating it, and she was on TPN for two years prior to coming to our center. Now, this is only a fraction of her history, but it really shows, and, and for those of us who have a great fortune of being able to help this patient, this story is quite typical. All these patients come with this kind of presentation. So it's extremely, extremely difficult to make sense of all this. But let's go back to the epidemiology. And epidemiology deals mainly with alcoholic-related pancreatitis, and the age is usually worldwide was documented to be around 40s, late 40s, 50s. Um, there, is a, uh, there is some recognition that came from the Brazilian study, however, that alcohol pancreatitis was seen only, thank you, was seen only in 40% of patients, and then they really concentrated on some of the other things, identifying idiopathic pancreatitis, familial, and tropical pancreatitis, which now is probably believed to be uh, uh, somewhat of an idiopathic pancreatitis going away from the tropical terminology. There is a marked gender difference, of course, predominantly it's a disease of men. Uh, in some series, it's as high as 90 to 95 uh, percent. However, in the United, because most of them are related to alcohol, in the United States, we are much more gender equal, and in the United States, indeed, the incidence of alcoholic-related pancreatitis is probably equally split between men and women. Uh, the recent Haas study in Holland shows approximately the same results. What's interesting about this table, and this is the incidence and prevalence, uh, but this table is actually just the incidence. But if you look at some of the trends, if you look at England and Wales, in the 1969 study, the incidence was about 1%, and in later studies, it had risen to 86 and if you look to some of the other countries that actually do talk about the incidence and increase or decrease, none of the countries have a decrease in incidence of pancreatitis. It is on the rise throughout the world. Uh, what's interesting about this particular study is, again, the recognition that initially in Italy, in Italian studies from 1995, the incidence related to alcohol was 74%. But in later studies, it was only 34%. So it's probably not truly really changing incidence. However, it's change of recognition of what is the real issue. In the United States, the decrease in alcoholic-related pancreatitis is not as marked, but it is also present. Uh, this is an interesting study, uh, widely uh, quoted in literature. It's the Olmsted study. And <clears throat> again, it illustrates the fact this is the line of the incidence, and this is the line of the pre uh, prevalence. And it deals with the fact that in men, it is non-alcoholic pancreatitis in incidence and in prevalence that is really the highest. So it, there is a shift from believing that it's the alcohol that is the primary cause of pancreatitis to other causes, and we'll get into it in a little bit. Well, we can't get away from alcohol and pancreatitis. It's a well-established entity. Uh, what I want to point out to the fact that um, men consuming 100 grams of alcohol per day were at 11-fold higher risk than control non-drinkers to develop chronic pancreatitis. This is quite relevant. Now, does anybody know how many grams are in one shot of hard liquor? Five? Okay, I feel like an auctioneer. Come on, give me something else. Four. It's 12. So to have 100 grams of alcohol a day, it's a significant number of alcohol. This is an additional study from France documenting that the incidence of pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, that is, is 83% related to alcohol. And it also is interesting that 67% of patients have 40 uh, grams of alcohol. And it, so this is actually not exactly the case because it looks like having over 120 grams of alcohol has a protective effect. It's, it's really not the case. It's just that the patients who do have it, 32% um, uh, uh, only, uh, probably many of them had died along the way and uh, had less alcohol. 
uh, <clears throat> the prevalence. Not everybody who drinks and develops and, and drinks alcohol will develop pancreatitis. And the incidence probably uh, is roughly uh, 1% to 3%. To 3 so it's really not quite significant, but of course it's, pr it's present. Smoking is a very significant risk factor. Uh, it, uh, it worsens the pancreatitis in those patients who do develop it. And smoking cessation does cause remission or does lessen the progression of the disease. Um, idiopathic pancreatitis is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, according to recent data, uh, only about 6 to 8% of cases in Europe um, had uh, been diagnosed as idiopathic pancreatitis. And the natural history of idiopathic pancreatitis can be divided into the early onset and the late onset. Those who are in the early onset develop it in the second and third uh, decade of life, and this is usually takes a while to develop, and patients live for a longer period of time. In exocrine and in late stages, it's primarily the exocrine and endocrine deficiency that can occur even without pain. Uh, the tropical pancreatitis is probably, uh, based on the literature at this point, should be considered not a misnomer, but it's really not an entity. And it's more now likely to be classified as an idiopathic. It was attributed in the past to be caused on all kinds of things. It was attributed to be caused by, uh, uh, by intrauterine malnutrition, high cassava intake, dietary toxic, etc. But it's now reclassified as idiopathic growing pancreatitis, and it's important to keep in mind that it's seen as probably one of the more common causes of pancreatitis in many parts of the world, including North India, in South India, in the state of Kerala. We have 70% incidence uh, of chronic pancreatitis that is due to idiopathic pancreatitis. And as you can see, the prevalence is quite high. Uh, autoimmune, biliary disease, and genetic diseases. Genetic diseases are becoming more and more important when we talk about children with chronic pancreatitis. Uh, biliary disease is a rather uncommon cause of chronic pancreatitis, although we, see, we do see it as a cause of acute pancreatitis. And autoimmune pancreatitis is also fairly uncommon. Well, this particular uh, uh, classification is important because it attempts to classify all the things that we have discussed into some kind of a reasonable sort of schema that we can all understand. I also like to point it out because of the brilliance of people who devise it, because their name is actually the name of the classification system. So this is from uh, University of Heidelberg, and uh, the, it's located in the city of Meinheim in Germany, and this, the, the classification is called Meinheim classification. How did they do it? Well, it's very ingenious. They decided that M is for pancreatitis, huh? but it's with multiple risk factors, so therefore it's an M. Okay. Then, of course, nicotine is important, uh, and um, they, I'm sorry, I skipped alcohol. Uh, excessive consumption, increased consumption, moderate consumption. So it attempts to classify how patients behave. Nutritional factors, uh, hereditary factors, which are very important. Efferent duct factors, which really relate to all issues of pancreatic and biliary anatomy. Immunological factors that are less significant, less important, and of course, other miscellaneous causes. Uh, this gives a scoring system. So this is a little complex, a little complicated in a way that, you know, to implement something like this in your system <clears throat> could be difficult, but yet it organizes things in an appropriate fashion to give us some kind of idea. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to give you, for example, an idea, uh, endocrine insufficiency will give you, if you have it, it's zero. If you don't have it, it's four. So it assigns a score to all the particular things that deal with the presentation of the disease, uh, with alcohol consumption, exocrine insufficiency, etc. And, <clears throat> and thus it provides us with some kind of classification. The classification, as you can see, is from minor to exacerbated, and it deals with the number of points, and it's quite easy to actually for somebody to get to 11 or 15 points, and that classifies as an advanced pancreatitis. Uh, we don't have much data yet in terms of how this classification impacts how we deal with the patients. 
but perhaps as we go forward, at least something that I would look here is would like to do here is to implement this classification, and although it's a little bit difficult. How likely pancreatitis is to develop? Well, it develops uh, in about 10% of patients with the first attack, and it can progress to 36% incidence in patients who have had repeated acute attacks of pancreatitis. And it's important also to remember that once someone develops chronic pancreatitis second time, the incidence increases rapidly to 38%. Our patient, we'll come back to her, I told you. So she was admitted to UHB, and she did have total pancreatectomy and islet or the transplantation. Uh, if you'll remember, she had a Whipple procedure, so a good portion of her pancreas was gone. And yet, thanks to um, Dr. Bala, she had 400,000 uh, international equivalents of islets harvested. Uh, she uh, had it uh, reinfused. Uh, she stayed in the ICU for four days, as is customary for these patients, at least for the time being here for us. And she was discharged after, initial after additional five days, total of nine days in the hospital. <clears throat> the costs, oh my God, this is so difficult to discuss, and Dr. Benerji talked about it a little bit as well, direct and indirect. Direct is something that really relates to doctor's visit, operations, everything that you can put a real price on. The indirect stuff is practically impossible, especially in children. How many days will the patient's uh, mother or father lose when they go with their child to the hospital or when the child is hospitalized? How many days will they uh, lose for all this? It's truly impossible. What about the length of stay for a person who works and they can't go to the work? So <clears throat> there is some data indicating that the, due to the financial, the, the patients do have significant financial difficulties. In the UK, there is a series of, that indicates 37% of patients with chronic pancreatitis were unemployed, 37%. There's another French study that shows that 12% were unable to work because of illness, and ability to work significantly declines as the disease progresses. There is a very granular study from Germany uh, that indicated that only 41% of the patients worked full-time, 3% part-time, 23 had retired due to the age, uh, or at least used that as a reason. 14% had disease-related early retirement, 30% were prolonged unemployment, and 6% were undefined. And yet of the employed pa patients, of the employed patients that were 41% or so, 40% of those had disease-related absence in the previous year. Uh, indirect and derivative economic considerations, it's, uh, there were a nice study published in UK, uh, about 265 patients, 14% of patients took early retirement, 13 had a period of prolonged unemployment, and you get it, there is just very, very difficult, but it's also very difficult to try to really put a price on this. Now, there is some data from the United States, and I do want to point it out, that <clears throat> from the U.S., the cost secondary to lost productivity from work-related absences related to productivity, unemployment, and premature mortality from all causes diabetes, that's from everything, and this is what Dr. Benerger was talking about before, is $58 billion per year, an astronomical amount. If we assume, and that's why I call this derivative, if we assume that uh, pancreatic disease accounts for 0.5 to 1% of all patients of the, with all cases of diabetes, then the indirect cost could be as high as <coughs> 290 to 580 million dollars a year due to chronic pancreatitis. Uh, this is a slide, and the numbers are here are from 2010. So the overall cost direct due to treatment of chronic pancreatitis in the U.S. in 2010 was $2.5 billion. And you will see in the next slide. That reason I like this slide is actually shows the breakdown. 327,000 uh, admissions to the hospital, 200,000 attendants at the emergency departments, and 532,000 visits from the doctors. So that accounted in 2010 for $205 billion and this is a table that shows how exponentially the number had increased just in the span of four years. 
So total cost 2.5, in 2014, it's estimated to be $3.57 billion. Now we can all sort of try to project what it could be in 2019. Now, take a little pause, we take a little break, just because we should. Take a, breath, take a little breath, and um, a little something always should be done to, to just enjoy what we do in life. And it should always be either hearing music uh, or reading music if we can't hear it. Uh, I like Hafiz, so I, that's why I use this opportunity to show it to you. I'll read the slide. And still after all this time, the sun, will never say, will, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. We continue. Now back to pancreatic insufficiency. Okay, <laughs> breathe again. So 57% um, will develop pancreatic, will have to take um, enzyme supplements. And of course, the cost just probably from the pancreatic insufficiency due to the medications taken is $75 million a year. Quite significant. Now, the most important thing I want to indicate about chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic exocrine insufficiency is the fact that the insurance companies are very, very difficult to deal with with prescribing of any supplements, Creon, for example, or whatever it could be, whatever your preference is. You have to have, according to the insurance companies, a strict, strict criteria. If elastase is not what it should be, according to their guidelines, patient is not going to get Creon. Actually, the newer classifications do indicate that if the patient either has a documented elastase or whatever the measurement you take, deficiency, or they improve with administration of enzymes, that is considered an exocrine insufficiency. And this is something important. It becomes part of our advocacy, part of what we need to do as a group of future physicians, current physicians, as advocate for our patients. And this is something that is really unacceptable. We can't get, I have two patients now that we can't get insurance companies to give them medication just because their elastase levels are not what they should be. So it, this is changing. Uh, we will continue to skip time a little bit. Uh, this is uh, endocrine insufficiency, going back to Dr. Benerge's presentation. Uh, and I'll just concentrate on this. In patients with pancreatic uh, diseases, the median survival is 25 years after diagnosis. That's with chronic pancreatitis. And the mortality is uh, frequently secondary uh, to nephropathy. So this is in patients, not just patients who have uh, diabetes for whatever reason, but this is specifically for patients with chronic pancreatitis. The most significant complaint, of course, is abdominal pain. This is what brings the patient to the doctors. This is why they get admitted most of the time. And the other things occur later. The exocrine and endocrine insufficiency will happen, but they will not happen right away. Uh, this is some of the quality of life concern. We are using a downstate, the SF36 uh, form. I think most programs use a variation of it. Although there is a specific Pancoli course, and this is specifically for patients with pancreatitis, it's developed as a tool. I don't think it's widely used as of now. Risk of cancer in, um, in chronic pancreatitis. It's quite significant. There are a land, several studies, and the incidence is anywhere between 1.2% to about 28 and even higher to about 4% in approximately seven years. So we know for sure that there is a correlation between the duration of chronic pancreatitis and development of pancreatic cancer. Um, it's also important to remember that in the specific subset of patients uh, with hereditary pancreatitis is 69-fold the general population, and in tropical pancreatitis, which is now idiopathic pancreatitis, it could be even higher. This is other causes uh, of diseases in patients with chronic pancreatitis. Very quickly to go through that liver cancer, small intestinal cancer, lung cancer, cerebrovascular disease, pulmonary disease, ulcer disease, and all these are significantly higher than in general population. The survival and mortality. Well, overall mortality rate at the, from the time of diagnosis at 10 years was approximately 30% in several of the studies. Uh, and the mortality can be as high as 55% at 20 years. And all studies are documenting the same thing with exception of studies that 
um, indicate that patients with idiopathic pancreatitis have significantly longer duration of life. The most common malignancy is the pancreatic cancer. And this is just for us to be again, we take a, quite, a tiny, tiny break again, uh, just to show that we can be a little bit uh, humorous and a little bit uh, just, uh, we don't have to be always very serious and take ourselves very seriously. This is from Louis Prima. Louis Prima, for those of you who may have heard him, he was a famous musician uh, in the 1950s, 1960s. He was a trumpet player, and this is from one of his songs. I just found this as very interesting, not the frequently uh, probably sourced uh, person at medical conferences. But just so we take ourselves a little bit less seriously, I'll tell you, hon, I read a little bit, but not enough to hurt me none. Uh, longitudinal study by Shuha uh, used the nationwide inpatient sample. And this is all the hospital admissions or most of them, from 1997 to 2014, and evaluating the trends in pancreatitis. And this is very important. So look at the trend line. The trend for uh, the discharges from 2000, uh, from 19, uh, I have difficulty to see it, uh, from 1997 to 2014, look at the market decrease in admissions, significant decrease, 41% decrease in admissions in the United States. Length of stay, significantly decre decrease, but not as much as the number of, uh, rather, discharges, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> but look at the mean charges. The mean charges have gone from 12,000 to 39,000 in 2014. So this is actually how much it costs to treat a patient with chronic pancreatitis when they do get admitted. Uh, and I do want to, uh, almost at the conclusion, uh, this is an important study, Inspire, and actually Dr. Berlin is one of the co-authors on the study. And it's one of the studies that talks about the actual direct costs of treatment of children with chronic pancreatitis. The study um, uh, dealt with um, submission of uh, forms to the physicians taking care of the patients and to the patients. And that data was analyzed, and these are the results. Uh, the condition is uncommon in children, although it is becoming more and more recognizable as, as a distinct entity, and therefore more children are now diagnosed with the disease. Uh, they are accompanied by large disease burden, including pain, emergency room visits, and recurrent hospitalization. Uh, the medical complications are costly with an estimated average annual cost of $40,000 per child per year. And assuming that the incidence is 0.5 to, of, uh, I'm sorry, 0 0.5 of 100,000 per year for chronic pancreatitis, uh, that uh, probably implies that $330 million will be spent. Uh, by extrapolating this cost from the INSPIRE registry, pediatric chronic pancreatitis alone may result in approximately $64 million of cost. To summarize our patient, prior to discharge, she had her first solid meals in two years. That was in the hospital. Mm. Uh, she went home. She had her first solid meal at home in two years. Her husband made her lobster. Uh, the pain that she, had got, that she had had for so many years is gone, and she's not on insulin. Now, this is not a happy ever after story, because every, none of these patients, or at least none of the patients that we have seen, um, are all of a sudden miraculously jumping out and you know, returning immediately to their life. Many of them have many, many issues. But at least we have solved that problem. At least she does not have the pain related to her chronic pancreatitis, and she's not on insulin. And this is the patient who had a partial pancreatectomy already. <clears throat> now, I do want to conclude with a small presentation from Gray's Anatomy. Who here watches Gray's Anatomy? OK, one, come on, be honest, this for God's Laura sake. Hillridge, age I know 11. at least she of was one. diagnosed with oh, hereditary pancreatitis at age Don't five. Stop. She's been hospitalized for the last six months. Then why haven't we helped her? 
A number of criteria need to align in order to perform her surgery. Her Apache 2 score should be below 4. Her MLA's lipase, LDH, and base deficit should be within normal limits. Her fasting glucose and C-peptide levels should All be... All right. All right. Got it. DeLuca? The hope has always been to do a total pancreatectomy with an eyelid autotransplantation, so she won't get diabetes or even need insulin shots. And today, all the elements have aligned. Your numbers are perfect, Nora. And today, no. we are taking you to surgery. <laughs> Nora! Oh, you can go back to school. <laughs> How long will I have to recover? We'll have you out of here before you know it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So much for informed consent. We're taking you to surgery today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to present. Thank you, Dr. Schwartzman.